Okay, I'm uh, Dr. William J. Weiner, uh, professor and chair of the Department of Neurology at the University of Maryland School of Medicine in Baltimore. And I'm interviewing today Dr. Anthony Lang, who's professor of neurology at the University of Toronto, a past president of the uh, Movement Disorder Society, and this year's Stanley Fon lecturer. This uh, Congress is the 15th Congress. Today is June 5th, 2011, and we're in Toronto, Canada. So, Tony, could you start out by just telling us a little bit about uh, your undergraduate education, medical school, and residency, how you started, and where you went, and how you got involved in movement disorders? Sure. So, uh, my undergraduate training was in Toronto. We're rather parochial as Canadians. We tend to train in the same place, stay in the same place, may go away for some of our training, but often uh, return to our uh, roots in uh, the original city. I was born and bred in Toronto, as a matter of fact, then, and did my undergraduate at the University of Toronto in Arts and Science. At the time, you were allowed to get into medical school with two years of undergraduate training, and uh, uh, since then, most people coming into medical school have much more training than I had. I uh, might never get into medical school uh, nowadays, but I, I did two art years of arts and science, went into uh, medical school, and uh, then went on to training in internal medicine. At the time, neurology was not what we call an entry-level program, so you always did internal medicine training first, and I was rather undecided. Uh, actually, I was going to be a cardiologist and was quite dedicated to becoming a cardiologist. I completed uh, three years of, under, or of uh, internal medicine training with the plan to go into cardiology. And I did uh, one stint in neurology. I remember uh, a weekend where I was on call and I was high from one end of the weekend to the, the, the next. It was. Uh, uh, seeing all sorts of interesting, unusual things where every patient was different, every patient gave us a challenge where you had to serve as a detective, as you know. Any neurologist knows this, but I didn't appreciate it at the time. Um, I had been uh, dealing with cardiology where it was all chest pain, palpitations, fainting, and shortness of breath. And here I had patients with spinal cord problems, with cranial nerve problems, with peripheral nerve and muscle. and um, so it was a, an interesting uh, experience that challenged uh, my original plan to become a cardiologist. So I then chose neurology, trained in that again at the University of Toronto. Um, and during that time, I uh, did some reading in movement disorders. There was no one in Toronto doing much of movement disorders at all. It was a nascent subspecialty, as you know, in the um, 70s. Most uh, centers didn't have someone that specialized in this field. They might have someone that did a little bit of Parkinson's as part of their uh, interest, but really no one was doing movement disorders exclusively. And at the time then, there were three major centers uh, to speak of. There were people doing it, but not to the same extent. Uh, Chicago, where you trained uh, and uh, were working with Hal Klawans. Uh, New York, where Stan Fawn had set up his program, and London, England, where David Marsden was. I, uh, during my neurology training, we had something called the Fireside Seminars. Uh, J.C. Richardson of Steele Richardson on Olszewski fame, uh, J.C. Richardson set these up in his home, and so the residents would come to his fireside and present their research um, um, uh, studies. Usually these were um, review of a topic uh, where they would share the, uh, the experience that they'd learned with their colleagues. And so my fireside seminar, and by that time Richardson had uh, retired. I worked with J.C. Richardson on the wards, but he uh, had retired and a man by the name of John Warrett was now the chairman of neurology. Um, we went to his home and my presentation was based on a review that uh, David Marsden had done. Actually, I think Dan Tarsi was part of this review on um, neuroleptic-induced movement disorders, antipsychotic-induced movement disorders. And this introduced me to really a tremendous um, uh, understanding of the role of dopamine and the, the role that neuroleptics played in causing 
many of the movement disorder phenomenon that we see, dystonia, chorea, uh, stereotypic movements, Parkinsonism, with different time courses. So this was um, an, an introduction to the movement disorder field that uh, got me interested and obviously interested me in one of the leading characters in movement disorders, David Marsden. So when it came to trying to choose a, a field, a subspecialty field, that was where, uh, that was one of my major experiences. That, that gave me the most intense uh, uh, introduction to one subspecialty field in neurology. It was just this fireside seminar I happened to do. So when I had to make the decision of uh, doing a subspecialty, that was, uh, that was the one I chose. So, and that was the reason I went to, uh, to England. It was uh, the person and the, um, the area that I had uh, explored maybe more intensively than most others. So the, the idea of the fireside uh, chats uh, sounds quite intriguing and a very lovely idea. I was just thinking residents today don't want to do anything uh, like that, you know, something out of uh, duty hours, perhaps it's different <laughs> in Canada. No, you're right. Uh, we, we actually give our residents a, um, a year uh, research project and at the end of that, midway through that, they do have to come together one evening to discuss how they're going to uh, uh, present it and, and discuss their, uh, their progress to date. So it is a little bit out of the, uh, the usual working hours that they're forced, and we give them a little treat at Christmas time with a nice dinner. But you're right, it's uh, common that they, they don't want to do above and beyond now. So, so tell us, uh, how did you get the funding to go to England? And uh, with that, was that your only choice to go to David Marsden's uh, place? Or what kind of funding did you have, and how no. was that arranged? Yeah, so um, the funding came from the, um, the uh, Medical Research Council at the time, which is now the um, center, of, uh, what is it, the CHR, the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. So there were MRC fellowships for training abroad, and um, I could have gone to any of those, and I considered going to Stanfon and to uh, Clowans, but uh, really chose to go to England and didn't apply to others. Uh, one of the researchers in Toronto knew David Marsden, Bill Tatton, who unfortunately has since very, fairly recently has passed away this year. Uh, Bill Tatton was the head of the research institute at our hospital, and so he wrote to David Marsden on my behalf. I also contacted people that had been training with David Marsden in the past, so I, I contacted Paul Bedard and Mark Hallett about their experiences, and um, they both uh, supported and encouraged me to, to work with David Marsden. The application was very simple. At the time, you wrote a couple of pages. It really depended largely on where you were going and um, your marks and uh, your reputation locally. So there were letters of reference from John Warrett, who was the head of neurology, and some local people, and David Marsden basically saying he's got a spot in my unit, and a little project that actually um, happened to be related to the fact that they were beginning to study uh, pergolide and lyceride to new dopamine agonists at the time. Um, and so the proposal was that I was going to do some studies with pergolide and lyceride, but remarkably little organization or, or structure about the, the fellowship. So the funding was probably quite enormous and you probably lived in a palace. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> if, if only. Uh, the funding was uh, limited. Um, I think I've probably told you this story before and that's why you're getting at it. Um, the uh, MRC fellowship was Canadian dollars at a time when the Canadian dollar was very weak compared to the pound and in the first three months of my training, the Canadian dollar slipped even further compared to the pound. So um, I, w we, uh, we lived on a shoestring. And in fact, um, I was very concerned that we might not be able to afford to, to stay. The original intention was a two-year fellowship. And uh, with the reduction in the strength of the, the dollar, I applied for some additional funding and was able to get a, a slightly uh, a small scholarship on top of what I had. And we lived frugally. We lived very uh, meanly, so to speak. Could, could you heat your flat? 
<laughs> Barely, actually. Um, there was a lot of concern that we actually had central heating, which was different from some places, even on the street. There were some places that didn't have central heating, and people used to have to feed the box to get any heat at all, or uh, particularly um, hot water. So some people would wake up in the morning and put their pound, uh, pounds in the, the box to heat up the, the water so that they could, uh, could wash. Uh, there were times in the morning our, um, our uh, um, pipes for the downflow from, for example, the sink in, in our uh, bathroom on the second floor would go outside and then run on the outside of the, the house. And it turned out that the angle was such that they would freeze. And I'd have to get up, boil water, and hang my head out the window and pour the <laughs> boiling water on the downflow so that I could shave in the mornings. <laughs> so what, what was your, your first impression of David Marsden? Um, I think that uh, everyone that had contact with Marsden uh, was impressed from the get-go. Uh, dynamic. Um, vivacious, uh, incredible um, uh, energy, brilliant, um, incredibly knowledgeable. His knowledge base was remarkable. His uh, ability to work from the clinic through to the basic science uh, uh, bench was really very impressive. And uh, I think that was something that you're struck with immediately and you're constantly impressed with. I, I, I was always really quite uh, impressed by his skills and abilities and all of the trainees were so impressed that you always wanted to please. You always were enthusiastic. You always wanted to present something to him and get his opinion and uh, I think that way he was quite a remarkable man that maintained that, that ability uh, and I think everybody that came into contact him were, uh, was impressed with, with that that remarkable skill and the, his teaching skills were really quite, quite amazing. Um, he's the only neurologist that I've ever come across, and you might remember this because you did some time in London around the same time. And for the the viewer, um, it might be interesting to know our first contact was while I was a, a, a fellow, and you were uh, there in a sabbatical role uh, for a short time. So. Um, at the time, you might remember that uh, there were special rounds that David Marsden would hold with the neurosurgeons. And the senior neurosurgeons would present him cases and would ask his opinion, and he would pronounce on the cases that these neurosurgeons brought to, to his feet, so to speak. And I've never seen a neurosurgeon care that much <laughs> about what a neurologist uh, believed or felt, but they, they would bring their tough cases to him, and he would discuss procedure might be appropriate or what the diagnosis might be and so he was impressive on multiple levels. So this is going to really try your memory but what, what do you think was the most unusual case you saw with him? It actually doesn't try my memory because I'll, I'll always remember this and we actually put this in the preface of a book that uh, I've uh, edited since then. This was a man who presented with a very unusual dystonic jerky hand. This and isn't the guy with the glove. No, I don't taking think. Taking a glove on and off? No, no. no. Okay. Different, different case. Yeah. <laughs> okay. um, th there were a lot of really very interesting cases, but this one was, uh, it, I think we all sort of see now, so it wasn't extremely unusual, but at the time had never been reported. We didn't know what it was, and it was very pertinent because at the time uh, Jose Obeso, the current editor of uh, the, the journal, uh, was interested in patients with dystonia and myoclonus. And so, um, and I wasn't aware of this. I see the patient in our Friday clinic, and you would see the patient and then come into the main room where David Marsden uh, was holding court, so to speak, and you would present the case and he would ask your, your opinion as to how you would classify and what you thought. And so I presented this man with this unusual dystonic jerky hand and uh, there were other clinical features. I believe there was a bit of an akinetic rigid syndrome as well. Nowadays we'd have little difficulty saying that this was a patient with a cortical basal syndrome. At the time that had never been described. Uh, there was one case with 
what we now know as corticobasal degeneration. One case reported in the, the literature, actually there were a couple of cases by, I um, um, can't remember the first author, but this, this was the cort corticodentato nigral degeneration with neuron, corticodentato nigral degeneration with neuro neuronal achromasia. But no one really had seen this paper and we weren't uh, very much aware of it. So I presented the case to David and he said, uh, well, what, how would you classify? What do you think? And I said, well, I've never seen or heard of anything like this, but if I was forced to classify it, I'd say it's probably myoclonic dystonia. And I remember Marsden looking at Jose and smiling, and Jose looking at Marsden and smiling, because they thought that this was a naive uh, Canadian neurologist that really didn't have a lot of experience, and they were going to go and figure it out. And uh, they went to the bedside and realized that the Canadian neurologist wasn't confused, that it was an unusual case of combining myoclonus and dystonia. And, uh, that, wa that turned out to be the first case of corticobasal degeneration that Marsden saw, and it was published in a series of a uh, small number of cases uh, by Gibb subsequently with, with Marsden and Brain. So, you know, in terms of one of the, the stock questions in these interviews is, you know, who are your mentors? I take it that then you would say David was your primary mentor in the field? Well, it's kind of interesting. I've thought of that because I knew what questions were coming, and David was a, um, my boss. Uh, I emulated him. All of the people that worked with him uh, really tried to pattern their approach to cases, their teaching, their um, overall broad interest, the ability to try to bring the bench to the bedside, to be an outstanding clinician, to understand the scientific basis of what we do to be able to apply all of the different uh, uh, subspecialty fields and scientific fields to what we do. I think we all emulated that and tried to pattern our, our approaches on, uh, on the basis of what he taught us. I'm not sure I ever felt mentored by him, and that, uh, that was kind of funny. I, I'm not sure that he had been doing it long enough. He was the youngest professor of neurology in England at the time, and so he was still fairly young, and I don't think he had had enough experience in mentoring uh, junior people. And uh, it was kind of funny. While I was there, we traveled back to uh, the United States. So this was the first return to North America midway through my fellowship to attend a uh, neurotherapeutics uh, meeting and a Tourette meeting. And during our travel and the first night that we went out to dinner, I learned that David was considering coming to Toronto and taking the head of neurology. They, he had just gone to the American Academy of Neurology, which was held in Toronto. He gave his famous um, mysterious uh, functions of the basal ganglia a, a, a lecture, the Wartenberg lecture. And during that time, he had been a visiting professor in Toronto for quite a period, and they were trying to recruit him. And in fact, he was interested in the position. So he informs me that, uh, halfway through my fellowship, he informs me that uh, not only is he teaching me now, but he may be my boss in a year's time. And I wasn't too keen on that. It was kind of <laughs> funny. I had to think about that a lot. I was wanting to be the David Marsden in Toronto. I was wanting to be the leader to bring something unique home and to really develop something that Toronto never had. And to suddenly learn that you might be coming back and being second fiddle and <laughs> having your, your boss now uh, be uh, the, the director of neurology and have to work with and under him was an interesting challenge to the way I was planning my, my future career. So um, I wasn't too sure what would happen after that. Obviously it never happened and uh, never uh, came to be. So um, I don't think I would classify in the time that I was with him and uh, at least for the next little while, David, as a mentor, the way I think of mentorship now. But I'm not sure I was a great mentor in my early years as having uh, uh, fellows. I think now I concentrate quite a bit of my effort in true mentorship. I think the first real mentor I had was probably Stan Fong. Um, 
Stan, when I returned to, to North America, Stan invited me to a couple of meetings. He showed that he was interested and tried to encourage my, my involvement in the meeting. I always remember there was a, a Myoclonus meeting that was held at um, uh, a conference center that was owned by Columbia, and Stan invited me to that. And I didn't give a lecture. I sat in the top row of the, the seats in the small lecture theater, and Stan suddenly said, um, Dr. Tony Lang, what do you think of this? And that was the first time somebody really cared what I, what I thought about anything. And so he was trying to encourage junior people in becoming involved in, in the field and knowing that the more senior people were particularly interested in what they thought and, and, and they cared about that. And then Stan invited me to be a member of the, um, uh, the editorial board of the Movement Disorders Journal, although David was a co-editor and so I'm sure David had a role to play in deciding who the editorial board was going to be. So I think I, maybe I don't credit David enough with uh, behind the scenes uh, involvement of, of me in the, in the field and in the society, uh, it's the, the nascent society. So uh, I think it was only years later that uh, uh, David was, played a, a more active role in mentoring me, but it was, again, behind the scenes. I don't think I saw as much of what might have been happening as occurred. So do, do you think that that was sort of a, not a personality difference between Stan and David, but more, you know, the English reserve and the North American yeah. more openness? <laughs> <laughs> it, it may have been. I always... Uh, tell a story that we may as well get on tape. Uh, I, I was relatively brash as a, uh, a trainee. I was a senior medical resident, as I was saying earlier, before I became a neurology resident. And in my seniority as a, a resident, I was working with people who allowed me to call them by their first names. So in my training in, as that senior level, I did infectious disease and everyone was working on, their, on a first name basis. I then came into my neurology training and my first day on the job, I was introduced to the head of neurology at the hospital I was working at and I said, uh, do you mind if I call you John? And he was taken back a little bit and he said, yeah, I guess that's okay. And then there was another senior neurologist, John Norris, working there at the time, who I know very well now, and delightful guy, but um, he was a Brit. And uh, I once again, in my brash uh, way, I said, do you mind if I call you John? And he said. Oh, I don't think so. Dr. Norris would be better. <laughs> <laughs> and so when I went to work with David Marsden, I did sort of the same thing. Um, I said, what should I call you? Because everybody was calling him Professor. Uh, Peter Jenner, for years and years, called him Professor, long after I uh, started to call him by his first name. So I asked him what to call him, and he said, my friends call me David. And I said, well, do you mind if I call you David? And he thought for a second, then said, yeah, that's, that's fine. So he... he wasn't too reserved. I think he was a little more progressive than the average Brit. But <laughs> <laughs> so, so there's another famous story that you, ha that you have to tell. All right, you have to remind me. Which is, uh, did he give you some famous advice when you were completing your fellowship? <sighs> You're going to have to remind me. I'm not sure that I got too much advice from David when I finished my fellowship. But was, was he predicting the trajectory of your career? Oh, this was, um, yeah, this was not during the, uh, on leaving. Um, this was that trip back to North America, so halfway through the fellowship. Um, my first uh, international presentation, I actually had two lectures uh, to give, having never given an international lecture. And uh, David could be a real tough taskmaster uh, sometimes and um, we went out to dinner and um, there might have been a little more alcohol involved than we uh, wanted to admit and uh, that evening David really asked me what I was going to do with my career because I really hadn't been um, uh, that productive I hadn't had too many novel thoughts <laughs> to, to that point. So he wasn't quite sure that I was going to really be a creative scientist or a, a productive uh, um, member of uh, the academic field. So he was sort of questioning whether I was really going to be um, uh, make it in the, you know, cut, cut it in the cloth, maybe. I see. But you've outlived I've, that. I've managed to uh, get over that, uh, that criticism.
So I didn't sleep a wink that night. So that was a trip, remember, that I had just learned that my uh, boss might be coming to Toronto and I was going to have to th either work under him or find another job, really. And then that I really hadn't been very creative in my first year and hadn't been very productive and hadn't had a novel thought. And now I have to present the next day my first international uh, 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 talk on some of the work that I had done there and I and I was jet lagged uh, having drunk. been mm, and and had a, <laughs> too much alcohol as well and I literally did not sleep one minute that whole night and had to present my first talk the next day I think I did pretty well actually to his credit but that was his, the way he did these this he didn't praise people to their face and uh, I've I've learned that maybe in my my junior mentorship I probably didn't do that enough and maybe a lot of us don't do that enough I do it more often now um, but I learned after the fact that Marsden told I think it was Jenner or somebody uh, that I gave the best talk at the meeting but I never knew he thought that <laughs> so that that actually brings up another topic which is uh, you know in talking about mentoring uh, what advice uh, would you give to young people starting out uh, in movement disorders or neurology, uh, really, get, particularly since you just told that experience, which could be very deflating to somebody and sort of really get them off track, yeah. and then we would have missed your stellar career. <laughs> well, I think you've, you've learned, number one, that I was pretty brash and self-confident. So I've, I think if you're going to work with somebody that could put you down periodically, you have to have pretty thick skin and a big ego. Uh, so maybe that let me uh, let me get through. On the other hand, I have also emphasized the brilliance of the man, and um, the uh, the incredible desire that people working with him had to 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 please and to follow in his footsteps. That I think was quite critical as well. So if if the person doesn't have at least at the time great mentorship skills, then they have to have some other. Uh, talents and, and abilities that would really want you to, to, to work with them. I think more and more nowadays we appreciate the role of mentorship and the fact that often people aren't born with mentorship skills. So for example in our university now we have training to mentor the mentors, to teach people how to mentor and what people need from a mentorship relationship and we also have programs for mentees to learn what you should be getting out of a mentorship relationship and to realize that one person may not provide you all the, the, the needs you have as a mentee. So we're often encouraging people, if you're, uh, say, interested in uh, neurology but also epidemiology or electrophysiology uh, or education, you have one mentor for this particular purpose but recognize they may not be able to satisfy all the needs and you should cover a variety of different other um, capabilities or expertise with with other mentors so if I was advising a junior person now first uh, and foremost to do what you really love to to find something that can turn you on that uh, can maintain your excitement and interest don't do it for convenience I've had people come to me and say well, um, should, what field should I do that there isn't enough interest in? Or, you know, I'm looking for a job, and so I've got to pattern my or, or work myself in a way that might make me more saleable in an area that no one else is doing or whatever. It might be that no one else is doing it because it's boring and you won't be happy with it either. So I think uh, clearly um, the, the emphasis on doing something that would really turn you on and keep you interested. Um, do it in the best place, obviously. Uh, don't just do things out of convenience. And I think one thing that is different that we have to take into account when we talk to our, our junior people and trying to mentor them is that lifestyles, lifestyle interest is very different than it was when you and I went through. You often gave up your lifestyle to get to a certain point, and that's why I lived in the uh, the uh, mean circumstances that we did for a couple of years and if it weren't for a very understanding wife and some tolerant kids uh, we probably wouldn't have managed nowadays I think that the, the interest in maintaining a lifestyle is very different and it's not necessarily wrong I mean the the way some people used to work when we trained and, and dedicated themselves exclusively to one thing and then forgot that they had to cover 
other sides of their life. I think that's why uh, oh, uh, relationships could be weak, or maybe um, uh, divorces were probably higher, etc. I don't know whether that's going to change now that we're seeing people uh, more dedicated to maintaining a lifestyle. It may not, who knows. Um, so recommending that they, they follow a dream, uh, find good people to work with, um, don't do things out of convenience, I think, and recognize, as I was saying, that uh, a mentorship relationship also involves a contribution on the part of the mentee, that there has to be a bilateral arrangement, and that maybe the first mentorship relationship you get in is not necessarily uh, working or the best, and so you, you admit that. You, re you try to s establish a relationship where you can turn to the person and say, this isn't working out, I need something else, and find some other way of doing it. So it's funny that you mentioned about the, the personal aspects of uh, how people run their lives, because just last week, we had our graduation for our neurology residents, and they put on a skit, as many places do. But before they showed the skit, they, uh, they had this uh, montage of all the couples and the marriages. And, and I was looking at the backgrounds, and I was thinking, these people, you know, they're, they're going on all these international trips. Why aren't they working? <laughs> <laughs> so I, to go back to that again, because you, you certainly... Uh, uh, have had a very uh, productive career, which has involved a lot of travel and moving around. So would you, would you encourage someone to follow in that kind of a path? Do you think that that leads to any problems? Or uh, I mean, you were sort of talking about that already. Yeah. But. It's, it's really tough to know. Um, obviously, to uh, reach the kind of level we're at, you need to give some things up. And uh, there has to be an understanding and an open relationship, say, with a significant other if you're married, that, that understands that. And the individual has to be um, understanding and uh, respectful of the needs of the significant other. And um, I don't know that there are any, there's any easy way of doing that. We, we've got a number of residents now, for example, whose spouse has a very strong career and they're not able to go to another place to, to, uh, to do a fellowship or whatever and it's unreasonable to expect them to do that. On the other hand, in our training program now, we have, for example, a summer social where we encourage the residents to bring their spouses or their girlfriends or bring the kids. We, uh, we have a lovely social in, in July where you have kids running around all over the place. That didn't exist when I trained. I mean, you were an individual, you did your training, but the, the other side of you wasn't part of the, uh, the program to any great extent. And so I think we are more understanding and respectful and attempting to recognize that uh, a holistic kind of approach to, to our residents is, is uh, important. But you raise a very important point. Um, to get to this level, you've got to you've got to play on in an international stage. You've got to be willing to give things up as well. And I, I'm not sure how to balance that. That remains an ongoing, very, very difficult challenge. And I was away a lot. My wife brought up the kids, and I wasn't there as often as I think I probably should have been. Um, we've survived because she's been tolerant. <laughs> Some other couples may not have survived. I, I don't know. I don't think there's a magic formula. I think it you have to adapt. So along those lines, that was a very humanistic answer. And, uh, but I wonder, I wonder, when you reflect on the way the residents or fellows are trained now, taking all those things into consideration, do you think that's better or worse, ultimately, for training? Time's going to tell. I, I don't know. I think um, we still encourage really good people to do all the things that I've just mentioned. Uh, and I think the difference is that we acknowledge that there are other factors in their lives that may force them to adapt in a way that we might not have expected people to adapt previously in another generation. And I think that's probably good in the long term. I think that uh, we have to um, accommodate in ways that probably departments and programs weren't very accommodating uh, in the past. 
And I think if we do that, it, it, we're not coddling. I think that's the other thing. I think we can coddle and, and the, um, sometimes our residents, but I think that was always the case, but maybe a bit more so now, sometimes the residents are a little bit too um, uh, pampered, but I think we've got an outstanding residency training program right now. We've just finished a couple of days ago our last uh, academic event where the residents and fellows uh, present their research. And I must admit, I'm, I'm really, really proud of the people that are in this program, and I've seen them develop, the people that are leaving. We've got five outstanding people that are leaving, and despite all the things that we've said, some of them are going to great programs and I think are going to be leaders in the future, so we must be doing something right. So do you, do you think that, on another topic, do you think that uh, in the course of uh, your career, have you ever experienced any kind of uh, bias of any sort or barriers that, that were sort of social barriers that you had to overcome? I don't think so. As, as, as a Canadian, <laughs> 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 working north of the, uh, the, the monster below us, um, I think uh, you had to play uh, in this uh, um, very large sandbox, the United States, and I think uh, it, it's not realized, for example, the Americans don't realize that we're Canadians and we have to do the Canadian thing as well as the American thing. Um, so that's, that's a, sometimes a little bit of a challenge. I must admit that I've, uh, in the process, uh, not maintained the connections within the Canadian neurologic circle that uh, maybe I should have. So I attend the Canadian meeting very infrequently because I have to prioritize other meetings, including the American Academy of Neurology. But I, otherwise, I don't think uh, I've felt uh, barriers. Uh, um, no, I don't know that I'm aware of, at least. So let, let, let's turn to a, a little bit broader uh, discussion about the movement disorder society. And uh, what do you think, what do you think it, its role has been in the development of movement disorders as a specialty? I think it's been fairly instrumental in moving the field um, and de helping develop it. I think that um, if we think back to how it began, uh, it was the two sort of fathers at the time, uh, Marsden and Fawn, uh, really seeing the need for a journal and recognizing that our field needed some uniformity in its approach to a uh, very active clinical field. So it was largely uh, acknowledging the complexity of the phenomenology and as you know David and Stan were the leaders in the field of recognizing phenomenology. They began the unusual movement disorders sessions at the American Academy of Neurology. They ran these ar around the world where they when they uh, traveled and, and lectured and so the journal began with a recognition that this had to be uh, established worldwide, codified, recognized. It was the first videotape journal, as you know. And so um, I think if we look at the development of the society, it began really to run a journal for that purpose, to advance our field, to move it forward, to describe things in a more uniform fashion, to make sure people were talking the same language. And I think it, uh, it should be credited with uh, uh, beginning that and, uh, and firming it up. Um, it has gone l way beyond that now, obviously, in its establishment of a Congress, which I think is the leading Congress in our field, the understanding of its role in education across the world, the establishment of the sections, beginning with the European section, then the um, Asian Oceanian section, and now the Pan American section, all with principal uh, mandates of um, developing education within their areas. Um, and uh, working on uh, training young, young uh, movement disorders neurologists as well. So I think the society has really been um, a, a major um, component in why our field is where it is now. I, I think uh, given the people that have run it as well and, and began it with David and Stan. Do you, do you think that, uh, this is sort of a strange question in a way, because I think everybody <coughs> recognizes that David Myerson was a special individual and. Uh, but do you, th do you think there's any uh, danger, maybe that's not the right word, of sort of 
making him into sort of a myth. And, uh, <laughs> you know, like at this Congress, there is, you know, revisiting all these things, the yeah. David Marsden this and the David Marsden that. Do you, think, do you think there's any danger in that? Oh, I don't think so. I think uh, it's nice to have somebody that is a little bit mythical like that in our field. Um, as long as we pull them down to size periodically by having these kinds of discussions. <laughs> um, one of the points that I've made in the paper uh, that's in the um, special issue that came out this week um, that celebrates the, the anniversary of the society was that, at least in the field that I was asked to write about, psychogenic movement disorders, there was a very large hole in David Marsden's capability of diagnosing that. And in fact, in the time that I worked with him, and in all the time Jose Obeso worked with him, he never made a diagnosis of a psychogenic movement disorder, to our knowledge. And this is somebody who's running a big movement disorders program, and anybody like you and I know the proportion of patients that we see that have psychogenic movement disorders now, and I don't think it was any different then. I just think that he believed that um, he had seen, to, uh, as a bit of a, um, an apology, he had seen a number of people with dystonia who had been misdiagnosed as psychogenic and had suffered tremendously because of sure. that misdiagnosis. So he tended to push the pendulum to the other extreme, basically saying there's no such thing as psychogenic dystonia. Stan Fon recognized that wasn't the case and pulled the pendulum back. But again, in that time, David never diagnosed the psychogenic movement disorder, and he created some conditions that we're now beginning to recognize are probably largely psychogenic. And proprio-spinal myoclonus is probably the best example of that, a disorder that almost certainly a, the majority of patients don't have an organic movement disorder. He created the causalgia dystonia, and there's admittedly a great deal of uh, controversy about this, but many of us believe that the majority of patients with complex regional pain syndrome or re, uh, reflex sympathetic dystrophy and dystonia have predominantly a non-organic disorder. So I think if we keep in mind the errors that he made, uh, maybe understanding why he did that, and there was justification for the way he pushed the pendulum in that direction, I think we can demystify him, but also recognize the incredible strengths he had. And uh, really, I think one of the reasons for the, some of the topics at this meeting is that it, we're at an anniversary not only of our society, but also of that Wartenberg lecture that I mentioned um, uh, many years ago, the year that um, I almost learned David Marsden was coming to Toronto. <laughs> and uh, so we thought we'd celebrate that by uh, reviewing where we stand with the mysterious function that he talked about. So now I want to talk a little bit more about your career. And tell us about what, what you think uh, you're proudest of in terms of the various projects you've been involved in. Well, I think, um, apart from the projects, I think probably what I'm proudest of is building the program that I have in Toronto now, um, recruiting the outstanding people. Uh, we have a group of uh, seven full-time movement disorders faculty at the Toronto Western Hospital. Each of them have a, an international renown, so Janice Miyazaki, Robert Chen, uh, Connie Maris, Susan Fox. Uh, uh, Antonio Strafella. Um, did I get everybody? I've got to think. <laughs> I don't want to leave anybody out. <laughs> <laughs> so in, in that process, we have uh, Janice running clinical trials and education and doing an outstanding job of developing the concept of palliative care in movement disorders that I think, to my knowledge, she, there was no one doing it when she started to realize this was important. Robert Chen, an international electrophysiologist that has really led the, the field in her understanding of many aspects of uh, brain function. Uh, Susan Fox with a PhD in uh, neuropharmacology developing animal models and moving from the bench to the bedside. I've forgotten, I'm embarrassed, Elena Morrow uh, running our surgical program. And I, I have to remember <laughs> Elena. Um, Ellen, uh, I think, is one of the most outstanding neurologists in the world, running a, a neurosurgical program and uh, understanding the importance of the neurologist in uh, the care of patients with deep brain stimulation and getting the best out of it and working on novel ways of applying it. Uh, Connie Maris working on uh, uh, clinical epidemiology and uh, really doing an outstanding job and now 
uh, involving ge the genetic side of um, movement disorders and epidemiology. And our most recent recruit is Antonio Strafala, who I think is a world-renowned uh, imager, working now with novel ligands and asking questions about dopamine and in uh, impulse control disorders and other uh, behavioral functions. So bottom line, my, the thing that I'm most proud of is uh, building a program that I think uh, is unparalleled. I, I'm very proud of when I can say I don't think there is a, a program that holds a candle to us uh, in terms of the, uh, the depth as well as the breadth. Um, the other thing that I'm very proud of is the fellowship program. We have fellows, uh, we've trained uh, 50 or more fellows from all over the world. We're actually gathering them, those that have come to the, um, the meeting here, we're gathering them together on Tuesday night, first time we've ever had this number of fellows together at any one time. And uh, that is an area that I'm very, very proud of, to see the people that I think are going to be the future leaders uh, um, doing wonderful things. And that, that, that makes me very, very proud and pleased. And I think that those two things may end up being my most important contributions. I think I'm one of the few people around now that uh, has a capability of uh, being a broad generalist in movement disorders, having covered many, many areas. Uh, I don't think there are too many people that have published in as many fields related to movement disorders. So I'd like to see myself as, uh, as being uh, the general movement disorders doc, but doing it at a level that most people <laughs> can't hit. Uh, and I do like to be able to say that I cover the kinds of things that David Marsden uh, tried to do. I may not do it as well as he did, but um, uh, our program involves basic science, genetics, as I've mentioned, epidemiology and the clinical sciences. But we have a, a basic science program as well, and I can communicate with our scientists and try to sit and figure out uh, where to go. I love, for example, talking to John Bracci, who's part of our, our group as well, although he's not a neurologist and part of our, our, in our unit, but we've been very fortunate in recruiting him to Toronto as well. And the ability to talk to somebody who's a basic scientist and get them excited about what we're doing and I can understand what they're talking about, and uh, that, that gives me pleasure, and I think that may be one of the strengths that I I have uh, that might be a little different. So those are the kinds of things. That what, what do you think is the most controversial thing you've been involved in throughout your career? Controversial. I, well, I guess it's the, it has to relate to psychogenic movement disorders. Um, and uh, we still have this issue, as I've mentioned before, of the um, belief on the part of many people that uh, post-traumatic um, peripheral uh, trauma related to movement disorders is capable of resetting the central nervous system in some way and causing complex regional pain syndrome and dystonia, for example. And um, this remains a controversy. I think that we've provided at least some evidence in support of uh, many of these patients having psychogenic movement disorders. The challenge is to us, though, uh, we need better diagnostic tools. We, and I don't think we've ever said that, that the brain isn't abnormal in these patients. I think the brain is abnormal, but I think that the emphasis should be understanding the psychodynamics and, and how psychopathology uh, contributes to the development of the movement disorder rather than try to treat the movement disorder, for example, in the same way we treat idiopathic dystonia. I think it's a very different animal, and I think that those people that it, that treat it only on the basis of its uh, dystonic nature ignore a very important part of the patient. So again, looking back over the span of your career, not about you particularly, but what do you, what do you think was the most important advance that's occurred in these decades? Well, levodopa was already here by the time <laughs> I came in, so um, I, I don't know. Um, I think that uh, I see the frustration in the, um, the faces of our patients because they don't fully recognize that science moves uh, very slowly and transition from one understanding to another is not uh, um, logarithmic. It's, it's a very slow incremental uh, kind of process. Um, so I think understanding, obviously, uh, genetics is uh, a huge leap forward in our understanding of the role of genetic uh, um, contributions 
to many of the uh, disorders that we have. But as I'll mention in my lecture, uh, I think that um, the role of rare uh, monogenetic disorders, it's not clear what the role of monogenetic disorders is going to be in our understanding of a very complex multifaceted uh, disorder. And we may find that um, we're just scratching the surface now even with the single genes. And I think Huntington's disease is a very good example where we've known the gene for how long and yet it hasn't had an impact on our therapy at all. And so we may be naive in thinking that uh, we can explain it all with uh, genetics. Um, Deep brain stimulation, I think, is obviously one of the biggest developments, one that I must admit, I'll always remember, I was at a Parkinson's meeting, and it must have been Aleem Benabit was giving the lecture introducing how he was starting to do chronic thalamic stimulation, and I was a little jet-lagged and tired, and I had been in the meeting for a couple of days, and I stood up and said, this isn't going to be very practical. I don't. <laughs> I think I'll go for a walk. <laughs> they'll they'll never use this. <laughs> so, <laughs> you say that out loud. Or you... <laughs> I said it quietly to myself, probably. <laughs> so my ability to predict what uh, is uh, going to be critical to our field and uh, helping our patients may not be that good. So you know, uh, it's funny when you mentioned about levodopa was already in. So I started a little bit before you. And I was a medical student when levodopa came in, and I was working with Harold Collins as a student. And, <clears throat> you know, it was such a remarkable event that, that with the trial where you had patients in wheelchairs, and then they got a drug mm -hmm. and they stood up and walked. So I think that that forever uh, biased me for all the rest of the trials we do where you need a statistician <laughs> to know that you helped your patients. But, but you know, there's something about levodopa, and I'd like you to talk about this. Do you think that this rather remarkable and, in many ways, fortuitous and by chance discovery uh, that levodopa was such a remarkable drug for Parkinson patients, do you think in some strange way that that set our field back in the sense that, I mean, for example, you might say Alzheimer's folks, uh, you know, they don't, it would be tough for a movement disorder person to run an Alzheimer's clinic because there's not too much to do. Right. But on the other hand, uh, the science involved with Alzheimer's might be further ahead than we are in Parkinson's. I've often thought that. I think you're right. Um, thank God for levodopa for our patients because the suffering of living without therapy for their horrible movement disorder, at least for the years that they get the best responses, um, would be really quite something, and I'm, I'm glad we've lived in the era we have when we've had this treatment. But if you stop and think about the efforts that have been made and the huge amount of money that has been spent trying to deal with the side effects of levodopa, to try to capitalize on dopamine systems to a greater extent, all of the dopamine agonists, the dealing with management of motor fluctuations and dyskinesias and all the rest. If we didn't have the dopamine understanding, and um, uh, we're just faced with trying to understand the biology of the disease and uh, get at biomarkers and, and get at ways of, of changing the process as opposed to treating one chemical outcome of the process. We might be quite a bit farther ahead. It would be very interesting to know. Certainly, we'd have a lot of money left over to be spending on investing in these questions now. So, again, I want to go back to something personal. So I know you, you yourself on occasion, as we, we all do as we get older, have been a patient and have had uh, different procedures. And I wonder, uh, is, has your experience as a patient, has that informed you in any way in how you take care of your own patients? I've been pretty lucky. I think that... Um the care I've received in um, what I think is an excellent healthcare system, and I've, I, I think obviously when you and I are a patient, we get good care because you know who to call and how to twist the, the, the wheel and, and grease it and, and uh, speed up the system in a way maybe most patients don't. But um, I've been treated well, and I don't know that it's changed the way I've treated patients. One of the things that I pride myself in doing is treating patients in a very humanistic way, and I enjoy interacting with patients and their families. I um, recognize that if you see a new patient with Parkinson's disease, you've got a friend for life. 
Uh, and so you may as well get to know them and get along with them. And some people uh, do really become uh, good friends. And um, you really do appreciate the remarkable strength of the human spirit and the way they live with their disease and uh, suffer with their disease to a great extent. And as we all know, this is not a single person's disease. This is a family's disease. So you get to know the families and the spouses. And uh, uh, I think I've recognized that for quite a while. And um, so I don't know that being a patient has really changed the way I manage people. You know, uh, the uh, talking about getting to know families, I mean, I have the feeling, at least in the United States, that with all of the changes in financing of our healthcare system and of our National Institutes of Health funding, that really for academic departments, for movement disorder centers, philanthropy is really something that I think is going to be the core of survival as we go forward. And you've been, you've been rather successful with that in Toronto. Perhaps you could for anyone who watches the video, you can give them their, your tips on how you've managed that. Well, I got very lucky with my first philanthropic uh, um, outreach or whatever. Um, it was really a patient that I was caring for who was almost embarrassed into um, giving money to our division because he was being criticized for uh, making quite a bit of money. It's a, a long story that I won't go through on the tape. but. Uh, it gave me, the funding that came through by this um, method gave me um, quite a bit of freedom in not having to rely always on funding that we got from grants. Uh, it gave me freedom to take my time with the patients because my income wasn't necessarily linked to seeing multiple patients in short periods of time. And so I, I could take my time to teach as well as to um, provide maybe, I hope, a more humanistic uh, approach to listening to everybody's uh, concerns and problems. But over the years since that time, I've recognized that, uh, that people are open to approaches. Um, you care for people well. You don't try to separate out the wealthy from the people that can't afford to treat. I'm, that's the nice part about our system is that everybody is even. Um, I don't see somebody in a private situation. I see them, the, the wealthiest individual still sees my fellow before I see them and they get exactly the same treatment as the person who uh, could barely afford their next meal. And I think in fact that pays off because we give everybody good care and um, the wealthy recognize that, uh, that they are being treated in a very equal fashion and uh, they often have a better relationship with the fellows sometimes than they have with me. So um, when it comes to approaching people um, with means, um, I think they recognize that they've been getting good care and uh, sometimes you're very surprised that they're um, more receptive than you might have uh, uh, thought. We had a um, patient that had been a family that had been giving money for about five years, a modest amount every year to my research. And um, when it came to talking about renewing, I felt confident enough that they were going to continue to, to fund, but also confident enough that I had a nice enough relationship. And that was the thing. I had a good enough relationship with the family that I could ask, would they be willing to give more? And uh, within a day, they agreed to give $3 million for a chair. And this is how I was uh, fortunate enough to, to continue to build with uh, recruiting people to our, our unit. It wasn't a chair for me. It was a chair that I used for one of my colleagues. So um, I think that uh, it's having that relationship with the patients and families and feeling confident enough that they'd be open to your questions. I think so I'm much more aggressive, but I'm aggressive in a nice way. And I think that's uh, it pays. So I'm sort of getting to the end of, of my That's questions. <laughs> <laughs> but I want you, I know that recently you really received a very lovely and high honor in Canada. And uh, for those of us North Americans who are below the border, explain to us what, what it means to be an officer of the Order of Canada. Well, the, um, the Order of Canada is set up to um, honor uh, citizens of Canada for their um, contributions to the country. And um, you don't know that it's happening. Your name is proposed um, uh, quite confidentially. Um, 
quite a large number of people, I'm told, are polled and asked to write letters about your candidacy. And um, they then determine that you are, um, are worthy of the, the award. And then there are, there are three levels that they choose from. The lowest is a member, the second is an officer, and the third is um, a companion of the Order of Canada. And they decided to give me the officer level, the second uh, level. It's a tremendous honor, and um, I think that everyone that gets it is very proud, not just on a personal basis, but um, what it represents, what it means to your division and your group. Um, uh, everyone that gets it gets these little lapel pins that you wear very proudly, so every time I now wear a, a jacket, I've got it in my lapel, and it's a nice little representation. It's a um, it's a snowflake to represent the fact that all of the uh, holders of the Order of Canada are unique. They're all different, uh, but they've contributed significantly to the country. So um, it's nice to have been chosen, and uh, I, I wear it with pride. Okay, well, it's well deserved. Thank you. And uh, this is going to bring us to the end, unless there's something you want to say for posterity <laughs> that we haven't covered. Nothing for posterity, I don't think. Um, I'm happy with what I've accomplished. Uh, I'm really delighted that I've accomplished it with the society, and so it's nice to be interviewed for this purpose with the, by the society because the society has been a tremendous um, aspect of my academic and, and uh, intellectual life, and uh, I'm very proud of, of the contributions I've made, and I'll continue to work for the society as well as I can. Okay. Sir? Thank you. <laughs> very good. <laughs>